it's time to discuss the most annoying kinds of MMA fans, all right? I'm not talking about fan bases. I'm talking about specific types of fans, right? Those guys that try to seem super hardcore and edgy, right? Being a big fan is not enough. They've got to separate themselves from the pack. All right. Whether that's trying to be super sophisticated by watching Bellator saying patchy mix beats O'Malley, or maybe it's just them hyping up the most random prospect that makes us scratch your head and wonder why. We're also talking about those guys that are stuck in the Stone Age. They think McGregor is still that same guy. They don't understand the concept of aging. They don't understand the concept of what a KO can do to someone. And, you know, again, we've got a bunch of different fans to discuss. They're all annoying as hell. You've probably dealt with them in various Instagram comment sections, and you've probably gone to war with them before, but it's time to call them out. So without further ado, let's get into it. The first type of fan is... Up first, we have the wannabe hardcore fan. All right, now this guy has been rearing his ugly head for the past week, the past couple of weeks, honestly, but really the past week because Patchy Mix just beat... Uh, a UFC reject in Sergio Pettis. And these guys have been out and about saying that Patchy Mix, whoever the new Bellator champion is, whenever there's a new guy that's crowned champion in Bellator, uh, these guys come out of the woodworks to tell us how they would beat the UFC champion in their division, right? These are the same guys that'll swear up and down that 1FC has 10 guys that would beat O'Malley, right? Or that 1FC has 10 guys in every division that would beat the 10 guys in the rankings in every division in the UFC. 10 screaming hungry 1FC guys that no one's ever heard of Trust me, they're going to beat everyone in the UFC. These guys think they're so sophisticated, man. They want us to treat them like they're the Messiah. Like, they would like nothing more than for us to give them a standing ovation every time they say something like, personally, I think a B-leaguer would beat the UFC fighters. Uh, they want us to sit there and say, whoa, holy shit. Wait, you actually thought of that? Let's give this guy a round of applause, man. Woo Let's give this guy a round of applause. He's a genius. But in reality, you just seem like a bit of a fool. All right, because let's be honest, if you've watched Bellator before, and I cannot stand watching Bellator because, again, that they say it's an acquired taste, but I haven't acquired the taste for eating shit yet. All right, because Bellator is stink fest after stink fest. It's boring decision after boring decision, and it never fails to disappoint. And I think a lot of you would agree with me. But these guys are so invested in trying to seem sophisticated and hardcore that they'll happily waste five, six hours of their life watching shitty low-level Bellator fights. But the joke's on them. They just have low standards, <laughs> and they're wasting their life, essentially. So um, once again, there are good fighters in Bellator. There are good fighters in 1FC. Bellator, in my opinion, is worse than 1FC. I think that 1FC, every time I watch 1FC, I actually think that those guys are pretty good. Bellator, on the other hand, I'm looking at these Bantamweights fight, and these guys are looking as plotty as the middleweights in the UFC a couple of years ago. Really. No one dreams of Bellator. That's another thing that I want to bring up. Making the argument that Bellator is where it's at is essentially making the argument that like the Serbian League in basketball has the best players because they're the craftiest or they're the grittiest. Again, I'm not saying that there are no Bellator fighters that can come to the UFC and compete. We've seen a couple of them. But at the end of the day, they're only as good as their competition, right? Uzman or Magomedov is out here scraping by a decision against a 45-year-old Brent Primus who's completely washed and also a UFC reject, okay? Sergio Pettis is the competition for Patchy Mix. Sergio Pettis is a guy that, that couldn't finish a fly in the UFC. He was known for being an NPC that just goes out there <laughs> and and just floats around doing absolutely nothing. He couldn't cut it in the UFC. He's one of the most boring bantamweights to watch that doesn't know how to impose his will. Sergio Pettis is an absolute scrap from the UFC. And Patchy Mix sounds like fucking dog food, and he's just been consuming more scraps that the UFC has thrown out. All right? Engulfing more dog food is essentially what he's doing. I don't want to hear it, man. Patchy Mix also just signed a deal with uh, Bellator again. And he's saying things like, man, I'm the best bantamweight in the world, and the best bantamweight in the world signs a big contract, as I should. Like, that's all good. Take the money. That's totally okay to want to get paid. That's his prerogative. But come on, man. If you want to prove that you're the best in the world, you sign with the UFC and everyone knows it. And if you try to disagree with me on this, you're just trying super hard to seem all sophisticated and hardcore. You're essentially just wasting your life, and you think it's a, an acquired taste. But in reality, like, I'm just not acquired that taste for eating shit. 
<laughs> that's the difference. This guy has an acquired taste for eating crap. All right, so keep watching your Bellator. I'm a UFC fan, all right? And I don't mind a good old, ba a good old fashioned Bellator stink fest from time to time. It's just that usually I'm in the mood for a good fight, right? I'm usually not in the mood for a, a good old fashioned stink fest, okay? So yeah, have fun being sophisticated. I'll have fun watching good fights. Let's go to the next one. Um, the dude who hypes up the most random prospects to try to seem different. This guy is unstoppable. He's undefeated because you'll see him. Listen, this, this is essentially what this guy's trying to do, okay? The dude who hypes up the most random prospects to try to seem different, his whole shtick comes from his desire to create a gap between him and other hardcore fans by creating a new realm of what it means to be hardcore. And I'm talking about the guys that were hyping up Steven Ursic, right? The most random prospects they'll choose to hype up with the bare minimum skill sets. You have a flyweight that throws a couple of leg kicks and a couple of punches and has the bare minimum speed. This guy will be in your live chat saying, hey man, um, what do you think about Steve Ursic? I think he's really good. I think that guy's a problem. That you, you just scratch your head thinking, wait, why is this guy amazing again? Like he beat David Dvorak and David Dvorak sounds like a fancy name. Is this why this guy's hyping him up or some shit? Like David Dvorak was ranked not because he was that good, but because the flyweight division has like 20 people in it. All right. Let's be honest about this. These guys want nothing more than to try to set themselves apart from the other hardcore fans and try to seem even more hardcore. These are like the, the grand wizards. These are like the, the, the absolute philosophers that have been cast away from society because they're just simply too deep for the rest of us. And I can see through it. I can see through it from a mile away. <laughs> Steve Ursick is mid as fuck. And I was so unbelievably happy to see him fraud check himself by having a stinky, boring decision against a guy that really wasn't seen as that good. And they go into hiding when these guys get fraud checked as well. It's like they, they'll they never respond on how um, shitty the prospect they hyped up ended up looking in their most recent fight because they know fully damn well that at the end of the day, they're just trying super hard to be, <laughs> they're trying super hard to be hardcore. Um, and these guys also, and these guys will also go into hiding when they get fraud checked as well. The WMMA guy. Oh my gosh, man. Now, let me, let me be clear about what I mean. Uh, this is the guy that'll try to have a reasonable, cordial conversation about something that is just insane, right? Let's say that, that we're, we're on live stream. I'm talking to my chat about the goat list. Yeah, I got Volk in the top five. Honestly, I think Khabib might be a number seven. I don't know. Aldo, Aldo might be a little bit too high. Where are we going to place Aldo? This is the guy that comes into the conversation and says, what about Nunes? Personally, I think Shevchenko should be at number eight. What do you guys think? Like, shut the fuck up, okay? Don't ever, ever <laughs> bring these people into the same conversation as people like Bulk or people like Jones or GSP or any of these people. It's a different sport, okay? And, and I just cannot stand how they try to act like they're right up there with the other guys. Like, come on, man. It's a different thing. Amanda Nunes is fighting people that look like they've just had their first pad session. All right. It's a totally different game. If Amanda Nunes can't fight Sean O'Malley, but they're both fighting in the 135 pound division, don't ever relate them to each other. All right. They have different measuring sticks. Okay. These are the guys that will pace around the room as well. They're, they're tossing and turning at night, thinking about Valentina Shevchenko's next fight. And you know what? Hey, man, do you. I can only care so much is what I'm saying, okay? I can only care so much. Uh, they have Nunes and Shevchenko in their top 10. Just cut out the bullshit, all right? Just relax, okay? Let's get on to the next one. Now we got the dude who still lives in the Stone Age, okay? I'm talking about the weasel, all right? Now, a lot of you guys are going to be saying, whoa, what do you mean you're talking about the weasel? Uh, he's, a, he's a super high-level content creator. I know. I get it. But the guy's been living under a rock, all right? Now, it's okay, we don't need to be hard on him. He's, he's been frozen in time. But the thing is, uh, these are the guys that will say things like the middleweight division is so weak. It's just such a weak division, right? That the 155-pound division is the best division in the UFC. When in reality, it's like, yo, you're just regurgitating what's been said for the past five and a half years. You're living in the glory days. McGregor and Oliveira is not an interesting matchup. I do not want to see it. I could give less of a fuck about Conor McGregor versus anyone that's truly elite. 
and I'm tired of hearing about how Conor McGregor and his and his crispy left hand could be an issue for someone like Makachev because it's not. All right, you're living in the past. It's time to wake up. All right, the middleweight division, the weasel said, is weaker than heavyweight and light heavyweight. All right, now once again, man, a couple of years ago. I would have said, you know what? That could be true. The middleweight division is known for the wealth of talent that it has outside of the rankings. All right. There are so many up and coming prospects at middleweight that look really, really solid. And there's a lot of excitement. There's a lot of good prospects in that division, more than any other division in the UFC. And even the rankings these days are a lot better than light heavyweight, which is one of the most top heavy divisions in the UFC. And speaking of top heavy, the 155 pound weight class isn't the best division in the UFC. Now, when it comes to the top five, it's great. Outside of Benoit St. Denis, okay, there are no exciting young fighters in that division that are really making waves, okay? The Rafael Fiziev experiment has failed. The Mateusz Garamot experiment has failed. I'm tired of hearing MMA fans say things like, well, obviously 155 is the best division, but what's second? What's second place? Is it Bantamweight or it's Featherweight? Like, just, it's not 155, all right? That's all I wanted to say. I needed to rant about these guys. Um... The reason I had the weasel up there is just because he, he gave that middleweight take recently, and I just thought it was ridiculous. But, yeah, it's fine because they've been living under a rock. You have to at least understand that. If you've been living under a rock for a couple of years, I might be saying the same things too. All right, so let's get on to the next one. The guy who doesn't understand aging. Okay, now this is another one. I have Nate Diaz and his pip squeaks next to him, of course, the guys that are Nate Diaz wannabes. But these are the ones that just don't understand the concept of time, right? These are the guys that'll say things like, Diaz is going to wrap him up, bro. Or, yo, McGregor destroys Oliveira, bro. That's a terrible matchup for Oliveira. They don't understand that as fighters get older, they deteriorate in every single way, shape, or form that you could possibly imagine, right? A knockout loss? Uh, yeah, back to the drawing board, turn them around next week because concussions don't exist with the guy that doesn't understand aging. Right. Uh, Volkanovsky, who just got brutally knocked out by Islam Makhachev. Uh, no issue. He should be good next week to go. And uh, that doesn't at all um, limit his chances to beat Ilya Teporia when he's going to be cutting down a weight class. Again, fighters in their mind are these like mythical creatures that somehow are not confined to age and uh, injuries just like us. Right, they're in some separate dimension, uh, and it's almost as if these guys think we're we're in Mario Kart or some shit. <laughs> like they think that Nate Diaz is like a video game character that if he gets knocked out in one fight, let's just replay him and see what he can do. All right, now uh, they're always predicting fights as if the old washed up fighter is in their prime. Right, like Dominic Cruz fans, or at least you know the guy who doesn't understand aging, if he was a Dominic Cruz fan at least would say something like, yo, uh, I know Mally's good, but Cruz would walk circles around him and make a miss. Again, we're not living in the Stone Age. Um, one thing I will say is the guy who doesn't understand aging, he does happen to also live under a rock. So I guess you could group him with the last guy. But there's a special kind of vibe to these guys. There's there's the Nate Diaz neck look where they're looking up at you and they're they're acting like you're an idiot and you're always switching up on your favorite fighters because you don't pick them to beat someone because they are now 50 years old and uh like tony ferguson right tony ferguson uh patty pimblett he destroys patty pimblett i guarantee you patty pimblett's got a good shot all right so don't talk about wear and tear don't talk about a ko loss with this guy he does not understand that that actually has a devastating effect on the fighter. So let's get on to the next one. Next up, we have one of my favorites. This is the pump the brakes guy. All right. Now, this is the guy that for any fun prospect that most UFC fans are getting behind and starting to recognize is really good. This is the biggest doubter. All right. Now, I'm not saying he's a hater. I'm saying he's a doubter. This is the guy that's never impressed. He's the last one to get on board. Uh, he's always the guy that's going to say things like, you know, I think it's going to be closer than most people give credit for, right? Kind of like the guys that'll hype up the most random prospect. Whoever the hyped up guy is that's going into a fight, 
For example, like Benoit St. Denis, or most recently, even a better example was Diego Lopez going into fight Pat Sabatini, right? Pat Sabatini, not really a guy with a lot of hype, had a couple of good wins, actually was doing well. This is the guy that's going to say, pump the brakes on Diego Lopez because Pat Sabatini is actually pretty good. And I actually think it's going to be a tougher test for Diego than you guys think. When in reality, it's like, yeah, Pat Sabatini is going to get a hole punch through his face. And he's like a, a little miniature bantamweight out there in front of Diego Lopez. And all it takes is just the simple eye test. Like these guys, they don't use their eyes sometimes. Like sometimes predicting a fight is as simple as just watch their past couple of fights back. One guy is mauling people and finishing them in dominant fashion. And the other one is laying on top of their opponents and neck breathing on them and just controlling them and going to decisions. Of course, this guy's going to tell us that Pat Sabatini gives Diego Lopez a problem. And he's not even impressed when Diego Lopez goes out there and fucking smokes him and blows him out of the water. So total party pooper, always trying to seem super smart. And, you know, the only way to impress this guy is to win a fucking title. And then maybe, just maybe he'll think about hopping on board. Now, every once in a while, they end up being right, like Hamzat Chamayev. The people that were saying pump the brakes on Hamzat, saying, whoa, slow down. He's not that good. He hasn't really beaten anyone yet. They were right. Hamzat Chamayev got fraud checked. But usually, if you're one of these pump the brakes guys, you're just trying to come off as like, you know, the, you're, you're trying to come off as like the, the final say. You have the final say as to whether or not someone is a good fighter. And I think it's total bullshit, right? These guys are not fun. So it is what it is. Let's get on to the next one. Next up, we have the he eats him alive bro guy who you can find in a Instagram comment section on the daily. Now, we talked about the pump the brakes guy. This guy is not only dense, he's more like an immovable object. All right. Right. This is the guy that no matter how competitive a matchup is on paper, he'll find a way to say that one of the two eats the other alive. And I don't know what it is about this phrase, he eats him alive, bro, but it's just so, oh my God, it's so frustrating to see. It really is. Because the level of confidence that these guys have, I know you can't necessarily read uh, someone's tone when they're typing something out, but man, if, if there's a statement that can really convey someone's tone, it's the he eats him alive, bro. It's like the total dismissive quality about it, like, yo... Yo, respect to Jamal Hill, absolute legend, but Poeton eats him alive, bro. He shouldn't even show up to the cage, bro, right? This is the guy that'll say that Hamzat eats Duplessis alive after getting fraud checked, right? Like uh, Hamzat will, will, will not look that good against Usman. He looks like he's he's beatable now, but, um, you know, throw him Whitaker, for example, and yo, respect to Whitaker, but Hamzat eats him alive, bro. I just fucking hate this statement. I can't stand it. Uh, I know that some of you guys are going to be pointing your fingers at me because I've been someone that tends to sometimes get a little bit cocky about my predictions for fights that could be competitive. So I understand it. I know it feels like, you know, the pot calling the kettle black right now, but still, I'm just as annoyed as you guys are with me, essentially, is what I'm saying. Uh, I think recently I saw a comment on Instagram for like uh, Aspinall and Pavlovich. I think it was Full Violence posting how... Pavlovich is, is back and he's motivated and all that. And the first comment that I saw was, don't know who needs to hear this, but Pavlovich absolutely smokes Aspinall in the rematch, bro. It's like, where are you getting this from? Where are you getting this confidence from, buddy? All right? Because I need some of that, right? If I was as confident as these guys, then I could probably talk myself into Dana White's position, all right? I could be Dana White. Um, so, yeah, man. All you need, honestly, honestly, the best base for being successful in life is being a he eats him alive type of bro. To have that kind of confidence, all right, it's more of delusion, actually. So shout out to these guys. Uh, I just have to find a picture. This is exactly who I imagine. One of these guys. Look at the fucking facial expression on him, man. That is a, you know, listen, man, I totally respect it. I totally get it. But he eats him alive, bro. And you guys know exactly the tone of voice that I'm talking about. It's always the most competitive matchup. It's like Jared Cannonier versus Whitaker. Yo, uh, respect to respect to Whitaker, but Cannonier eats him alive now. I just, I don't know. I can't stand it. it. Drives me crazy. Let's get on to the next one. This is the new age Habib fan. All right. And I'm talking about the better than Habib guy. 
All right. Now, what I mean by the better than Habib guy is anyone that starts to cement a good legacy, anyone that starts to put together an impressive run, Alex Pereira is the perfect example because it's the most recent example. Pereira moves up a weight class, wins his second ever title fight. He's got four good wins. These are the guys that say he's better than Beeb, though, right? Just because they've been told to do that. All right. I'm on to them. You guys are trying to catapult him to the top of the GOAT list. And it just so happens that Habib is the measuring stick. It's interesting how Habib, right, the, the better than Habib guy, will tell you that, yo, man, uh, no disrespect, but Beeb didn't really do shit, though. Like, Beeb was, wasn't really like that. They'll say that, but that's the first name that they'll bring up when their favorite fighter starts to cement somewhat of a legendary status in MMA, right? If Habib really didn't do shit, though, why not bring up Aldo? Why not bring up Kamaru Usman? Why not bring up Stipe? They bring up Habib because he is the metric. He's the, the, the marker for GOAT status, all right? Now, again, I understand, I understand that some of you guys have a plight that I actually think is legit, and that is people saying Habib is the GOAT. I think it's total nonsense, all right? I think it's total nonsense, but I'm just like, anytime someone wins a big fight these days— there's someone in a comment section somewhere saying, yo, he's better than Habib, though. Greater, b did more than Habib ever did. And it's just like, dude, get the guy's name out of your mouth. Like, you probably haven't even watched him fight. And I think a lot of the fans that say things like he's better than Habib, though, they probably didn't even watch Habib like that. For real. These are probably like the, the newest fans that you could possibly imagine. Right? Again. Guys that are just on the band. I feel like these are the bandwagoners. I really do. Because again, the cool edgy take these days is Habib sucks. Uh, Habib's overrated. And I really think it's the opposite. I know some of you guys are going to flame me for this take. I know it's not a popular take, but I actually think it's the opposite. I think that people underrate Habib these days. Now, again, it depends on how you rate him. But there are more people saying Habib didn't do shit than there are saying, um, you know, Habib is whack. But there are more people saying than there are saying Habib is the GOAT, all right? That, that's just how it is. They've essentially turned into the new age Habib fans as well, all right? We used to talk about how Habib fans wanted nothing more than for Habib to be great just so he could surpass McGregor. As soon as he beat Conor, they wanted nothing more for him to eclipse whatever Conor's done in MMA, right? Um and that's kind of what we're seeing with people like Pereira and Adesanya, right? They don't like Adesanya. I don't like Adesanya. But a big part of why they want Pereira to be better than Habib so badly is because if he's better than Habib, well, he's clearly better than Izzy, and he totally eclipses whatever Izzy's done. I know that's not the only reason. I'm just saying that's got to be a part of it for some people, all right? If you're going to get down to the nitty-gritty of really what it is that makes these guys tick, right, that, that gets their ticker to beat— it's the, the fact that they want Alex Burr to be catapulted to the, to the top of the GOAT list, okay? These guys also don't count losses, all right? Another thing we have to talk about, um, better than Babe, though. Like, your favorite fighter could have 10 losses and 14 wins. They could go on a 10-fight win streak, turn their career around completely, and they're better than Babe. I get it, but I'm sorry, man. Like, Another thing that I need to bring up is that these guys don't count losses, man. It's like they completely ignore them. Alex Pereira, again, I'm just using him as an example. This guy got flatline KO'd. He's had six fights in the UFC. I'm sorry, seven fights in the UFC, six wins. Compare that to 13-0. and 0. But he's also been flatline KO'd, man. And all I got to say is that you have to count losses, right? You have to count losses. If you're going to measure someone's greatness based on their wins— you also have to measure their greatness based on who they've lost to, based on whether or not they have shortcomings. Yes, it's impressive when a guy can bounce back from a loss and, you know, overcome the adversity. But, you know, what's even more impressive if they never lose to begin with. It, now, again, guys, I understand that Habib has annoying fans and I understand that he's overrated by some people. But at the end of the day, if Habib is really a guy that hasn't done shit, why are you bringing up? your favorite fighter's legendary accomplishments in the same sentence as Habib, right? Like, wouldn't that kind of make it a little bit silly for you to compare your favorite fighter who's now achieving legendary status to a guy that hasn't done shit?
Let's get on to the next one. Last but not least, okay? The Eastern equals elite guy. All right, now I have the three musketeers, Renat Fakhradinov, Demir's Magulov, and Goram Kutaledzi. Three guys with beards. Actually, Demir's Magulov is without a beard, but he has the OV to make up for it. Every one of these guys is a future champ, according to the Eastern equals elite guy. All right, because of their beards, because of the last names, because they look super fancy, aka they look similar to Habib. <laughs> um, uh, see, they always see a competitive fight between two Russians, right? If if Demir's Magulov and the the Georgian uh, Viking himself, Goram Kutaledzi, have a a close little tit for tat battle where they're they're prancing around the octagon doing a whole bunch of nothing, uh, they're the next best things since sliced bread. Essentially, these are the next future uncrowned champs, because you you watch an American guy have a close fight with another American guy. Oh, yeah, they're just two stinky, shitty American guys. Dude, throw them out of there. I don't give a fuck. But if it's Guram Kutaledzi throwing his little fancy-schmancy spinning wheel kicks and Demir Makilov out there throwing hands, that's another thing that these guys will freak out about. You see a Dagestani guy throwing a punch, and they'll freak out because Dagestanis are supposed to wrestle, right? Um, yeah. Easy to manipulate. Easy to confuse. The weasel also may be a culprit for this, right? He, he is one of these guys too. And I cannot wait for these guys to get fraud checked because again, I, I can see and I can smell a fraud check from a mile away. I predicted the Guram Kutaledzi fraud check, okay? I predicted the Demir Magulov fraud checked and I, at least early on, smelled something fishy in the air with Renat Fakhradinov and in his last fight, he kind of got exposed as well because people were talking about Renat Fakhradinov as the next 170-pound Hamzat Chemaev. And even Hamzat eventually got fraud-checked. But Guram Kutaledzi was someone that I heard MMA content creators saying, he's really good, man. And he's a little bit different from the guy that hypes up random prospects, this Eastern equals elite guy, because at least these guys are usually good. Like, they usually have something about them, some part of their game that, like, stands out. For example, Demir Magulov is like, the, the guy from the East that throws his hands, he's more of just a boxer, and that stands out, right? Renat Fakhradinov has this, like, massive frame for 170 pounds, and he's also got grappling, which stands out. And then Guram Kutaledzi is just a guy that's super flashy, and usually when you see someone that looks like Guram, they are just shooting the simple single leg and controlling someone on the ground, right? So they stand out. I can understand why these guys get hype, but it's like... I kind of turn into the pump the brakes guy when it comes to these ones, right? So, you know what? We need the pump the brakes guy to sift through all the Dagestanis and the people coming from the East to really see who's who, all right? Sometimes you need to be that guy. But anyway, let's get on to the next one. But anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed the video. Until next time.